going to be talking today about an experiment involving thermal convection. Since many of you, and even those of you who are professional scientists, professional physicists, are likely to have a no a, a recent acquaintance with the research in classical physics, it's going to be the new subject for many of you. Uh, used to be that classical physics was classical. However, uh, we are engaged in looking at some of the old problems. Not that our colleagues in engineering and mathematics have ever let those problems slip away from their attention, but physicists have uh, let problems like thermal convection slip out of our professional minds. We, uh, have, many of us in condensed matter physics, are re-examining these old problems. And I'm going to report to you today on a study by a rather <coughs> large group. The major portion of this work is experimental. It's directed by my colleague, Albert Lipschebe, at the University of Chicago, with <coughs> the uh, help of a very and uh, intelligent, hardworking team. Once, they got, once those guys get the experiment done, there's another bunch of people who work on the data, and then still another bunch of people who work on the theory. And uh, you'll see what's, what's going on. Uh, I'm not sure I can justify all of these people except by saying that we all have fun with the problem. There is a long, distinguished history of work on turbulence in the thermal convection going back to the work of Frando, more recent stuff by Spiegel, and so on and so forth. I have to justify uh, the selection of uh, this problem as a problem to work on. And uh, the justification uh, is a given on this uh, transparency. In classical physics, we can look all around and find any of a tremendous variety of problems to be working on. We can look at the weather, as I was describing yesterday, a million of them. So in classical physics, more than, say, in astrophysics, we have to select our problems, and then we have to ask ourselves questions. Imagine the question being asked by a student. What's an interesting problem? Answered by perhaps by a professor or vice versa. It doesn't make much difference. Uh, one that helps to form uh, powerful ideas. The next question is clearly how do you find a problem like that? Uh, it, uh, this, uh, the uh, first wise person answers find something beautiful and general that nobody understands. Back to the questioner, how do you do that? <laughs> and then the obvious answer.
turbulent flow shown here. Now, that's not the kind of flow pattern I'm going to be talking about. Instead, I'm going to be talking about what happens in a pot of fluid when you heat it from below. Uh, in fact, it's not going to be any pot. It's going to be a particular pot of the gaseous uh, helium at 5 degrees Kelvin. Here comes another nice moment for me. Uh, as many of my friends here know, I'm a rather theoretical kind of a physicist and uh, couldn't actually do experiments if I wanted to. <laughs> However, my name is on one of the experimental papers. That gives me a right to say something I, couldn't, I can't say many times in my career. Let me show you a diagram of my experimental apparatus. <laughs> My experimental apparatus is hung inside of a doer, a flask in which uh, we keep the temperature at uh, roughly between 4 and 5 degrees Kelvin. The working part of this is that there is helium <coughs> fluid, gaseous helium, at pressures between a millimeter of mercury and roughly atmospheric, placed in this container. These are insulating walls. No heat passes through them, or rather, in fact, there's vacuum out there, and no heat passes through the vacuum. Here are some copper walls that are maintained, each one at a constant temperature. The bottom walls are maintained at a higher temperature, the top walls at a lower temperature, and this temperature difference produces a lower density fluid at the bottom, and a, I'm sorry, a lower density fluid at the bottom and a higher density fluid at the top. That's an unstable situation, and after a while, the, si the system starts to swirl. To give you an idea of the size of the thing, this is a cylinder, 8.7 centimeters high, 8.7 centimeters in diameter. There are two thermometers, there are several thermometers, the thermometers that measure the temperature in this piece of copper, this piece of copper. But there are two thermometers that I particularly want to point out to you. A thermometer which is hung near the center of the system and one which is hung near the bottom. These thermometers are tiny pieces of germanium, 0.2 millimeters on a side. Those pieces of germanium uh, have a resistance which depends on temperature. And using that dependence, the temperature in the neighborhood of these thermometers Measure. The thermometers respond very rapidly. They have a rise time of about a millisecond, and that's important because the temperature is going to be varying rather rapidly in time. Now, I said that the basic equations were known, and here they are. Uh, let me establish the, the notation is that U is the velocity of the fluid at a particular point in space and time c. This is the time derivative of u. That's acceleration. Uh, we're just going to write down Newton's laws here. Acceleration of the fluid occurs because there's a gradient of pressure, because there is a, a force of gravity. The force of gravity, g, <coughs> acting in the direction, uh, acting in the direction, g <coughs> acts that way. The Z hat and the vector pointing up that way. Alpha is a thermal expansion coefficient, which says how the logarithm of the volume of the fluid changes as we change temperature, derivative of the log volume with respect to temperature, and T is temperature. This says that the acceleration is produced by a gradient of pressure, by a buoyancy force, by a viscous drag, <coughs> and by an inertia term, U dot gradient. This U dot gradient U is the term that produces all the dirty work because it's a nonlinear term of the equation and we don't know general ways of solving nonlinear equations. The fluid is said to be incompressible, so we take give dot U equals zero. There is also heat moving through the fluid, the temperature T, which varies in time because the uh, of thermal conductivity, <coughs> thermal diffusion is this term, capital S squared T, and also because the fluid is moving from place to place, carrying heat with it. That's 
dimensionless quantity, which is, me which is measured, is the Nussel current, <coughs> which is the heat flow uh, from bottom to top, divided by the heat flow that would have occurred where there's or where there are only thermal conduction going on in the system. Okay, that's it. No, I don't have to tell you anymore. I've set up the problem. Here is the set of equations. There is, uh, I showed you the geometry. We've got all, everything is known except the answer. <laughs> but this is not uh, um, at, the, at the level of a candidacy exam because the answer is a little hard. Uh, let me start out and tell you a little bit about the answer. I'm going to start from low temperature differences across the cabin and move up towards higher temperature differences across the cabin. So we heat from below, cool from above, there's a low density fluid above, below, a high density fluid above. Whenever this Rayleigh number is less than five times 10 to the fourth or so, the system just sits there and heat is conducted upward. The fluid is moving. As delta is increased, an instability is produced in the direction of setting the fluid in motion in a swirl like this. This part of the swirl brings hot fluid upward. This part of the swirl brings colder fluid downward. There are swirls in the corner. And uh, what we see in the end is that part of the heat is being carried by the motion of the fluid. That's called convection. An orderly process of convection goes on until the heating rate gets a little bit larger, and then the swirls start to become unsteady and oscillate. Heating rate becomes a little bit larger, that is the Rayleigh number becomes a little bit larger than that. Uh, the uh, system becomes chaotic. It is just wiggling, but there are part of it's wiggling this way, and part of it's wiggling that way, and they wiggle at incommensurate frequencies to one another. But there are only a few different motions going on. Perhaps one thing I do with this hand, one thing I do with that hand. But basically, the whole cell is doing only a few different things. Then as the Rayleigh number is increased still further, they get to be more different kinds of motion. Until at Rayleigh numbers be bigger than three times 10 to the fifth, some kind of turbulent motion occurs in which what goes on in one corner of the apparatus seems to have no correlation with what, what goes on in, in another corner of the apparatus. Finally, I say finally only because it's the end of this slide, finally for Rayleigh numbers bigger than three times 10 to the seventh, the system goes fully turbulent and you get a very complicated pattern of a swirling motion which uh, covers the entire cell. I'll start out by showing you one picture of that pattern of motion. May I have the very first slide? Thank you. Now, this is not Van Gogh's picture of, this is not Van Gogh's picture of the starry night. This is something very different. This is a visualization of the flow that is going on in a tank. Not the helium, this happens in water. What happened was that some things called fish scales, little pieces of plastic, were dumped in the water, and the fish scales reflect light, and what you're seeing is the reflection of the light off of the scales. These lines here represent lines of motion of the fluid. And what I want you to do is get the feeling that at high values of the Rayleigh number, there's a complicated, swirly pattern of the fluid with a very fine grain to it. A very fine, swirly pattern going on through the entire fluid. Slide off, please, thank you. One can see that in another way. Here are uh, measurements. Uh, listen, there are measurements uh, done on the two thermometers. Recall. that we have a box, <coughs> that inside the box there is some swirly motion of the fluid, and then there are two thermometers, a center and a bottom thermometer, set there and there. And this, I emphasize, this is a real world, real time experiment. This isn't time
time in picosecond for millions of years. These are seconds, one, two, three, four seconds. This is a recording of the temperature uh, observed in the center thermometer or this bottom thermometer uh, in uh, real units. Uh, this each uh, division here represents the entire temperature difference across the cell, a temperature difference being a few hundred milligrams divided by 250. And the temperature goes up and down, up and down, in a very complicated, hard to understand pattern. It is our job to understand this. Uh, well, some of you may be packing up your pump stuff right now, saying, hey, fella, you can't expect to understand stuff like that. Time to go home. Well, there is some, I want to give you evidence before I, before uh, actually leaving, that will uh, indicate uh, that there are simple things to be said about the results of this experiment despite the complexity of the uh, pattern of temperature versus time. Nusselt number, as you recall, is a dimensionless measure of the heat transfer from bottom to top of the cell. It is the heat transfer divided by the transfer which would have occurred had there been no motion of the fluid. Raleigh number is a measure of how far you're pushing the thing. As I said before, at low temperature differences across the cell, the Nusselt number is one, that is only conduction occurs. Then at five times 10 to the fourth or so, you start to get convection. That as you heat further, that convection becomes oscillatory, and then in this tiny narrow window, chaotic, and then you get a region that you might call soft turbulence, and then a region which we call hard turbulence. I'm going to concentrate today on this region of Raleigh number between 3 times 10 to the 7th and 10 to the 12th, which we term hard turbulence. And I want to convince you that there is something simple going on. Well, this is a plot on log log paper.
experimental colleagues, all of them very clever, uh, have any knob that runs between 1 and 10 to the 12th. There's no knob on their apparatus that they can change over that range. But the <coughs> both the kinematic viscosity and the thermal conductivity, or the thermal diffusivity, depend on the density of the helium. And in varying, in fact, this is essentially linear the density. They vary the density over a, a wide range by either putting a little bit of helium into their cell at low pressure, a few millimeters of mercury, one millimeter, or, or going up uh, towards, uh, room, uh, towards atmospheric pressure. As they vary the uh, uh, density over a, over a range of about 10 to the fourth, they can then vary the Rowling number, which is proportional, inversely proportional to kappa nu, over factors of 10 to the eighth. It's really then the pressure that they control. Now the reason I mentioned that when I show you this slide is that these points are at one filling, one value of the pressure. These points are at another, and these points are at third. There's an important check on the experiment to see that the points overlap. Now, I have, uh, I'm in the process of trying to convince you that something <coughs> simple is going on in these experiments, despite the apparently chaotic pattern of behavior. I will do that with another kind of 